I mean, that's what I wanted to talk about. Just tell me about like what it was like to come over from Pakistan to the U.S. I mean, that's a great amount of faith, Sam. It really is. You know, brother Bo uh, uh, Rob. You know, it's it's been a very painful. It's been very stressful. Uh, first time when I came in the USA in uh, 2004. You know, <laughs> I didn't have any bank statement. I didn't have any money. You know, I couldn't even afford my plane ticket. You know, I borrowed money in order to come to the USA for studies. You know, fortunately, I got scholarship, which helped me a lot. So the my visa in my visa process was it just like a miracle um everybody telling me they are not going to visa you don't have bank statement you don't have money how come you can get a visa and they told me your application is not very you know powerful you know your application is very weak regarding uh, regarding getting visa so i just told them you know no matter what i'm going to apply no matter what so, and i did it and that was very interesting because when they asked me to come inside the embassy for interview, they took my passport. That's what they do. And later on, they call you, you know, name by your name when your turn comes. So that lady took a passport from me and she forgot. <laughs> and with everybody, I got inside the embassy like eight o'clock and I was sitting over there five o'clock till five o'clock. Everybody left the embassy. And I was sitting by myself and security guard came to me and he told me, why are you sitting here? I said, that lady is supposed to call me. He said, but she already done and she's wrapping up all the stuff. What are you doing here? I said, but she has my passport. Oh my God. And he went back to that lady, American lady, and told her, uh, there's a guy who is still sitting over here. <laughs> so he think you got her passport. So I, that was, I mean, Brother Rob, you know, getting American visa is so difficult for Christian people, especially when you are applying from a country where you are living as a minority, uh, especially in a Muslim country. Right. It's very difficult because they judge you. I mean, getting visa is just a miracle, I think. You cannot get American visa unless God intervened. Mm. So that lady came back to the window. And he saw me and he was, she, she wanted to make sure whatever I'm saying is true. I said, yes, I gave you my visa of passport. And she asked her secretary and told her, would you mind to see, uh, look in, uh, uh, look his uh, passport in the cubby hole? And she went over there and she said, I found her passport over there. And she told me, it's okay, I'll give you a visa. So I was excited. I forgot everything. <laughs> so that's the way I got visa. <laughs> That's good. You know what, though? The, the moment I think I met you in 2009 at CCU 2010, and uh -huh. I think you were working at the school because I want people to know that your scholarship was not free. You yes. earned, you worked for that scholarship. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a scholarship, but I know you worked really hard for it. And I think that's admirable. And the whole time you were always in a good mood, always smiling. And uh, oh, me? Yeah. No, brother. I think I I was going to say the same thing to you. <laughs> <laughs> You're very smiling, relaxed, and calm, and so I always feel feel good to meet you. Well, I do too. I I cherish our friendship, and I wish we were closer. But uh, but see, this is this is good. I can smile, but in here, I might be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it's good. It's good. I, I just really, um, with all you're doing to come over through all those hurdles, just to maintain uh, a positive attitude to accomplish, you, you got your degree, then you went back and then uh, getting your doctorate from, you got it from Pakistan online. Is that how you did that? Yes. Yeah, I did this way. Yeah. Within two years. And I was just stuck in my office and spending so much time on it. And, and definitely Brittany played a crucial role in it too. Sure. Uh, she was thinking about, she said, you know, you better, you can just do it. I said, what I want to do with my doctorate? She said, it, it, it will be good for you, just like a credibility, you know. Sometimes the people, they just, they don't care about what you're doing. Sometimes they just like to see if you have a title doctor, you know. Very true. Very true. But you earned it. And, and while 
planning a church, pastoring a church, building a school, raising four girls. That mm. they're right there. That deserves a trophy, man. But I will say, <laughs> and they're beautiful girls. But I would say, literally, I mean, the one thing I noticed too, it's the same as Heidi with me, is that you have a very supportive wife. Uh, oh, she, she, oh, she's everything, you know, after God. I guess. Yeah, Brittany's uh, very admirable too. She really, she sticks to her gun. She got your back, and um, it's just impressive. Brother Rob, you know, that when we got married at that time, before even we got married, people, even the very, uh, you know, staunch believers, they started telling her, Brittany, you are going to, to, to commit suicide because you decided to go to Pakistan. And people, they were not encouraging to her, but she was so committed. She said, no, I think that's God's calling. So I will go over there. Yeah. Then people start challenging her. Oh, yeah, Brittany, you you know their language is so hard. It's a uh, it's, it's it's a bad country. People they don't uh, uh, didn't treat women uh, nicely. And when you will go over there, uh, they will put you in a cage and you will be in the prison. All kind of thing, you know. Um, but she she stuck with me, yeah. and because of her, I mean, God blessed us so much. Uh, my daughters, anytime when I feel stressed, when they come and just hug me and just kiss me, I mean, it's helped me a lot to get over my stress. So I think God just gave me four daughters just to make me yeah. get over my stress. I yeah. think people, they think they have four daughters, they may have a lot of stress, but I think, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stress is a reliever, actually. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, that would be a thought to come. Um, but she married a godly man, a Christian man. And uh, and I do remember when you first went back, you and I talked frequently in the beginning, how the struggle of being a Christian. And I think I think uh, if you could get into that, being a Christian, I remember you telling me there was only like second and third class jobs. It was hard to get water. Go through that a little bit. So Brittany risked this, you risked this, and you took this on to honor God with your life. When you have an education from USA and you have a a uh, little bit good life and people they when they realize you have some resources brother rob i can tell you the truth this is to truly help you a lot to survive in a pakistani country sometimes i sympathize be sympathize with my christian brother and sister they they're very poor in pakistan inflation is on the horizon so so yeah it's it's it's, it's becoming as, actually when i came in 2000 14, uh, came back from the USA to Pakistan after my MD. Uh, I mean, the circumstances were, you know, um, seems uh, getting better. But now it's, it's, it's very bad. Uh, people, they're running out of their food and it's so kind of stressful. So the people, they just seem hopeless and everybody looking for help. So somebody can help them to move in any other country. Um, but um, in other kind like Thailand or maybe Malaysia or even Sri Lanka, I mean, uh, or maybe even India. And a lot of people, they already moved away. So they have no choice but to leave Pakistan because they know anytime anybody can falsely accuse you. I mean, you can say whatever you want for your justification. Nobody going to hear you. And once you get that stigma, there is no, I mean, place in Pakistan for you. So let me ask you, was Nazir, was he a relative, Nazir Gil? No, he, he's not my relative. He actually lived far away. That was this horrible kind of incidents after uh, the Muslim people, they attack in Faisalabad and they burned down like in more than 100 houses um, the last year, last year, I think. And we went over there and took a lot of kind of the ration and financial support for those uh, Christian people and so later on, after a few months later, they killed this um, this person who has a small business, shoe business, and the Muslim person just jealous of him, and they just make a false accusation against him, just like telling people, you know, he discredited uh, Quran, and nobody even tried to talk to him and let him to speak uh, for the clarification, yeah. and they just burned down his factory. 
and later on when he came and they start beating him and well, beat him to I, death. I saw the pictures. Uh, I think you sent them out for everybody to pray for them. Now, how far is that from from you to get there and help them? Uh, that when I went to the <clears throat> houses which were burned by the Muslim people, that was like a two or three hour from my house. So that's not easy, uh, Sammy. I mean, you're really going out of your way in a, in a country like that to get to those people and help them in the name of Jesus Christ. Rob, you know, that's, that's nothing. I think sometimes I feel bad about it because um, I can do everything. I mean, <clears throat> lately one guy, he just told me, uh, my pastor, my, you know, uh, my team uh, person, and he told me there is a 13-year-old girl. She's raped by the Muslim security guard. And he was telling me what we have to do. I said, you know, I can't do it. I can't, you know, go in everywhere. Um, there's so many needs and there is so much kind of the insecurity among the uh, Christian people. I said, I cannot resolve each and every matter, you know. Mm. But as far as the uh, Pentecostal people, once they get a lot of money, most of the time they just move to the USA and leave behind a little kind of small kind of the pastors and let them to do the work and just take everything in their control. So the mm -hmm. Pentecostal becoming a big problem, not teaching the right doctrine, and just manipulating people and just not telling them the salvation, but keeping them after the physical healing. Hmm. People like that emotion. They like to jump around. They yeah, Because this is this is my culture, because here, over here in Pakistan, people, they're very emotional, you know. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you can easily, but when you're poor, what they're looking for, they're looking for somebody who can stand with them and tell them, hey, I am with you, you know, don't worry. Whenever you need my help, I will help you. So that's what every Pakistani uh, Christian person want, especially when you're a poor person. Yeah. So you, you're ready to do anything because you're looking for support. Wow. One of my one of my hopes, one of the, the whole purposes of me doing this is because I know some really amazing people, you being one of those people. And I really believe like this is something that needs to be picked up by like the U.S. media. Stuff like mm -hmm. what you're doing, supporting you, and then talking about the things like the girl that was raped, talking about the churches that were burned down, what you have to go through to get food there. And then as we were talking before, even with Anila, talking about the brick kilns, uh, people mm -hmm. don't understand it. Would you talk about the brick kilns, what people go through there? Oh, you know, that's, that's another kind of the, uh, very kind of sour subject to talk about. A lot of people, they're working in, at brick kiln factory for three or four generations uh, when you born at uh, at at a, a brick kiln factory, you have no idea what is a life um, living out of that brick kiln uh, circumstances. When you meet them and talk to them, they just feel like uh, you know that's just just normal life. And when we meet them, I I always tell them this is not a normal life. You know the way you're living, and you cannot have a control on your. Um, uh, you cannot protect your family and anybody can maybe take away your wife and they can take away the young daughter and they can rape them and they cannot even speak for their rights because those factories are located in the remote area where most of the time people, they have very, they're far away from the cities. So those people that just living in a small community in at that brick hill and just do work day and night. Uh, I mean, when you see those people, you can see how they look like a uh, collection of bones. Mm. I mean, skinny people. I mean, you are making like a thousand bricks uh, and walking in a squat position, going back and forth, maybe hundred times. And I mean, their, their knees, they're touching their ears. I mean, they're so skinny kind of thing. And the women, you can look at their faces and you can see the hopeless faces and you can see, you know, uh, man, that woman, she seems beautiful, but she does not have any beauty because they have so much work and their just skin is just burned. I mean, they can be maybe very light skin when they're born, but working in the under the sunshine, 115, 20 and 30. I mean, you can just uh, lose your uh, physical um, beauty. Yeah. Uh, so when I, when I want to talk to them and, and tell them, you know, how about we can take you out? And it, it surprised me. I took one or two families and unfortunately they decided to go back. Really? Yes. 
Mm. So after that, we decided we have to uh, to find out the people that really want to come out. They really want to come out, and we start to making a kind of them marriage or start to make some kind of them uh, terms and condition. You know, which person we supposed to help them to come out. First of all, we have to see how many times this person returned to this factory after being released um, or how long this family has been involved in this um, brick and business. If they are very, very fresh people, they just came first time and they've not been work over there for a long time. I mean, those people, when you take them out, they, they would not like to come back. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the people... They are already working for one or two generations. They have incl inclination to go back to the same business. What well, What do you think? What makes them want to go back, Sam? Is it just the inability to adjust to normal life, or yes, yes, that's that's a one challenge. Then they, uh, when they come out, they don't have a like a residence. Suppose we release few family, and uh, after that, we have a big challenge, and that challenge was how we can provide them a residence. Mm. Uh, what should we do? Uh, they have kids. If we have to send them to school, they need a permanent place to save so they can send their kids to school. So we don't have enough financial support so we can provide them a residence. If I can buy like a two or three acre land and just we can make the houses, housing over there and provide them housing, those people, they can stay over there. And we can also build a school over there and we can also provide them a micro business over there, mm -hmm. maybe poultry or maybe raising cattle and maybe a little bit other like handic handicrafts kind of things. So that's just a future plan. I told them if we will do that, then we can keep those people at one place and in provide them the environment where they feel comfortable. Then we can <clears throat> provide a uh, counseling and we can also provide them a pastor who can uh, uh, visit them regular on the regular basis, teach them about Jesus Christ and their kids. They can also go to school on the regular basis. So that's my future plan. That's, that's the challenges uh, I felt after leasing them. So if anybody's listening or watching and they want to support this, <clears throat> like how much would that cost you to get started? Uh, if we can buy the like a three or four acre land, at least we need like a three to four hundred thousand dollar for the just for the land wow that's more yeah. expensive than the u.s and in some places because, yeah because there are more people and less land in america there are less people more land so it's sure. easy to buy acre land i mean people they have houses you know it can in this way it can be expensive the school where we built it that school that school plot is 50 by 90 square foot okay and we paid for this land because it's in the city. It cost two hundred and fifty thousand dollars just for this land. Just for the land. See, people over yes. here say, "Why aren't we doing more in Pakistan? Why aren't we doing <clears throat> building schools?" People don't understand the financial challenges. That um, yeah, it's, we it's, all want to do it, but it, it's it's expensive. And can you imagine that this school, which you can see in the picture? Maybe you have already seen the videos brother rob it took me 2004 that was the first time i uh, started telling people about it 2004 and this school happened in 2023 20 years mm -hmm. 20 years just to break ground just yeah to get to that point and you know and 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 didn't happen by the um, many people actually just you know just two or three people they just realize it's so important cause and they stood up and one guy he donated seventy thousand dollars wonderful and i have no idea so i realized if that person wouldn't have donated this money this school could have been delayed 20 more years oh wow just raise that fund i mean then another person i was just i spoke in the conference and one a uh, senior gentleman, he came to me and he said, I really want you to build that school. He's around about 80, 89. So he said, how about if I can give you $150,000? So, yeah. So that's the two people. Yeah, they definitely make this school happen 
yeah. sooner, you know. Otherwise, I still uh, would be raising fund. You know, I, I hope the right people see this video. I really do. I pray it over this video and I'm asking people to grab this vision that you have, how important it is and how impactful it is in your community. Hey, Sammy, I can't see you. I can only see your eyes. Yep. Wait, really? There you go. You there you go. That? Now I can see you. <laughs> I'm much better. <laughs> people need to see how sure, good looking sure. you are. They need to see how handsome oh, sure. you are. Thank you. <laughs> I I know you have a YouTube channel that shows the construction of your building. Where can we go? Do you know? Can you give that to people to see? Oh yeah, definitely. There's no problem. If you can send that to me, I'll put it in the link so people can see what you're actually doing. It's it's amazing because of the odds. Again, the financial obligation, and you basically came over here with nothing, and went over there with this vision to improve your community. I mean, it's 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 ama it's godly. Uh, it's amazing, brother, the, the odds, again, that you've overcome through Christ to make things happen. And that's the reality. See, I've told people some of your story, and, and I've literally had people look at me and go, that's not true. I don't believe that. <laughs> literally say that to me. And I'm like, well, we in America, it's not really a reality. But in no. countries, it surely is. No, I always tell them, America, it's okay. You know, if you don't trust me, that's okay. Come and visit me, and I will take you to places, and you can find out, you know, those things are real. Yeah. And they're real, you know. But, you know, being a Pakistani Christian, uh, because I grew up in this, those kind of the, uh, people, so I, I feel uncomfortable, but not like American people. Yeah. Because I know the language, I know the culture, and I can see the people, I can figure it out. Either I go along in conversation, religious conversation with this person. Should I, um, I have to know the limitation, how far I can go in the conversation. Naturally, I can figure it out a lot of things. Sure. And what languages do you speak over here, Sammy? Uh, we speak Punjabi okay. and Urdu, mm -hmm. which is a national language. Urdu, Punjabi is my mother language. Okay. Uh, one of the unique things that you're doing over there as well is translating books from English to your native language. I am doing like a, a Dr. Cartel book, Faith Once for All. So I, it been, uh, you know, Rob, I just hired some people. Even I hired a, one Muslim guy who has a, a PhD degree in Urdu language. The language which I am translating Faith Once for All. Yes. So when I saw his translation, I realized he was doing a lot of Google translation. Uh, and when you read a Google translation is helpful, but sometimes it's a literal translation. So I'm working on this project. So far, we finished like a 23 chapter out of maybe, I think we have six or maybe seven more chapters. Wow. And then you'll have it ready to go. Yes. So I think that's going to be a great tool for Pakistani people I agree. and our and in the I, I didn't tell you about our school in the evening we are planning to have like a Bible certificate you know Bible courses in the evening classes at the same school building outstanding so you're not really busy I mean you're not you're four girls pastoring a church building a school translating a book getting your doctorate I mean you got plenty of free time I mean what <laughs> I did a brother. I did not know if I start to count those things. It seemed to me <laughs> overwhelming. You know yeah. the way you counting. I never counted those things. <laughs> and that's I'm just, just the view. The, you know, it's every day kind of with the every day. Whatever coming up, okay, just do it. Yeah. <laughs> and you travel to the U.S. You know, once a year, or whatever, and that, 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 yeah, that's what um, we try to do. Because if we don't go, you you understand American culture very well. American. Uh, uh, they are so busy. If they will not see your face, you know, they will not see you in person. Sometimes it's easy to forget. Absolutely true. I was afraid to call you and say, hey, can you give me two hours? Because I'm like, he doesn't have two hours. No, I, t I told you, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to God. I have few people. They are working with me. So sometimes it's helpful because I can give them this job and they can do on my behalf. Yeah, like in the churches, I'm not preaching in the one church. I always 
preach in the circuit. So this Sunday I am on this church and the other pastor preached three Sunday, but I preach in the four churches one by one every week. So let's talk so about that. Let me talk about that because I, I know a little bit about your ministry, but I, I want people you to tell people you go over, you, you start this church. Now talk about how you did it and how you grew it. That's a very interesting story because I was a, uh, I was just like maybe in a high school, maybe 10th grade, when I started calling young people in my colony and asking them to come and let's sit together and talk about Bible. I didn't have any kind of official Bible kind of that training. But whatever I learned from my father, so I just go to the crossroad and see some people there standing over there chit chat whatever they're doing smoking i always come hey brother let's go and do something uh about uh, about jesus let's talk about jesus so at the at the very early age like if age of 15 or 14 i used to have a, maybe 20 young people we all sit together and we just start the book of acts and start reading and just explaining whatever i can can and and I am still running this class till now. We always pick the different books and just go verse by verse and to a lot of people they started their own churches. So you started back in the 90s. 90s, yeah. That's that's very true. Maybe to get 1990 like that. Yeah. And you come back to the you have a church, a building, right, where you minister? And I, I think in 2002 <clears throat> Uh, I was still in a college. I may be in the 20s, 90s or 20s. I started my first church. Okay. And I saw when you got back, you start, you built a baptismal, some things like that. Yeah. So I, when I uh, came to the U.S. in 2004, I already left church behind and I <clears throat> left some friends. They've been a long term, my friend of my Bible class uh, students or my disciple. So they took took care of that church while I was in the U.S. for two years. So after, in 2006, I came back to Pakistan and spent three years. Then I, in 2009, I applied for the MD uh, for Cincinnati Christian University, and I got in Cincinnati. Right. And that's when we met, I remember. That's by the time. 2009. <clears throat> so then you finish here. We graduate. We graduated together. Didn't we graduate the same class, 2012? Yeah. Uh, I I think I got graduated in 2014, I think. Really? Oh, yeah, I think so. I was trying to think of when we graduated. It was... Uh... 2014, I think. Okay, 14? Because 10, 10, 11. Because, uh, yeah, I think it could be 2009, 9, 10, 11, 12, 9, 10, 11. I think 14, maybe. Okay, 14. And you go back, you take over, you you take over church. Now you have campuses too, don't you? Didn't you plant some campuses or smaller uh, churches? We used to have a school, but we shut down that school during the corona. But that school was, we were running the school for maybe 10 or 12 years. We've been running that school. Uh, but later we shut down that school because we didn't have enough fund okay. to rent. <clears throat> How much does it cost to run a school like that, Sam? Uh, the school we are building now, which gonna be finished. The building gonna be finished in maybe January or February. Um, I already had a budget, and if you will be interested, I can send you the maybe uh, that budget. You can maybe look at, and maybe if some people they're interested to to participate uh, in it. Like a, I don't mind if there will be a, some people they are expertise on education. Somehow they can help us in education and making a school better. Or maybe some people, they can come to Pakistan, maybe teach like English courses, or maybe some people, they can come for one or two months. They can teach in, uh, computer training. Uh, some people, they can come and they can come and teach maybe two or three months or one month kind of the Bible, uh, intense Bible class kind of thing. So we need a lot of help. That's, it, that's the one thing, but financially, Definitely, we will have a teacher. That building only be cost a lot. It's like a three floor building, and uh, we have like eight classes in it. So every class must have an AC, and so the people that can come. But we want to open this building for Muslim and Christian kids both. 
Got you. Man, that's that's awesome, Sam. That's and how many people would you say have come to Christ in the last, say, ten years since you've been back? Oh, I I mean I can count. I mean just uh, yesterday I baptized twenty three people. That's <laughs> a yeah. Yesterday that was yeah. Yesterday, just yesterday, I mean Brittany she was trying to and uh, you know download upload those pictures and um, videos, but somehow because because of the internet. Uh, it took a long time. I see. She just, she just told me they got uploaded now, so Excellent. you can you can see those things. If you want to invest in a ministry, this is a ministry that's really making a difference in this world, specifically in Pakistan. Support Sam and Brittany in prayer and financially if you can. And I'm going to put some stuff in this video or the description to help. Maybe some people will donate. I don't know. I'm going to try. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> see what God no, does. I you know, brother uh, Rob. You know, um, we we are the servant of God. You know, if that that is His work, He gonna provide everything. You know, so definitely through this interview, I'm I'm, I'm a very kind of a staunch believer. God must move some people's heart. Sure. You know, sure. Yeah, I remember having you. I think it was 2012, Sam. You came out to the church I was pastoring out at Sugar Tree Ridge. I did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted you out there so bad because it's a great church, but they're so detached from you know some of the reality of the world because it's a small town. Not, not no disrespect to them, but Rob, this is very, very serious, and uh, uh, American people they must must uh, consider those facts and make themselves. Um, active and intentional to reach out that community. Yes. Uh, and on the other hand, Christian people that just, they just so kind of the, uh, worried about the feeling of other person. They think if uh, telling people Jesus Christ is the only way to life, maybe some people they can get hurt. So we don't want to hurt the feeling of other people. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the Muslim people, they are very, vocal and very blunt and they have so many dialogue with american people and just uh i think they they're they, they've been very successful so far because they have very kind of a unique tool in their hand and that is a hospitality which is very uncommon in the usa and i know and i believe and you believe too hospitality is the integral part of christianity Sure. And you can bring so many people, you can win so many people's heart by your hospitality. Yeah. And they are using this tool. Yeah. They are very kind, very bold, very bold here. I have some good friends that are Muslim. I have a friend, Ahmad, up the street. We talk on a regular basis. Wonderful. Uh, I, he goes to Jordan and back. And I actually asked him um, his perspective on a lot of things because it's very unique. And very different, and I'm grateful that we can have deep conversations. Um, he, he, the <laughs> war that's going on between Israel and uh, Hezbollah, mm. and all that, he is angry over that, you know, very angry at Israel. I mean, one time, I mean, nobody in Pakistan, nobody want to go to Dubai, nobody want to go to Saudi Arabia, don't, nobody want like to go to Turkey, nobody want like to go to any Muslim country, but to Europe or America. Yeah. True. And and at the same time, they are so bitter about the same people and about that they are so bitter about America, where they're living. And I mean, they have a pre prestigious life. They have wonderful life, life over there. And they also think without America, they can their kids cannot even succeed. Hmm. But at the same time, they're so bitter. Yes. You can see it all over the United States, big time right now with the with the protests and things. But they come here because there's no pushback. Sad, but I agree that the only thing they understand is strength. So I saw that, and, and some of the, the Muslim guys, I, I enjoy the conversation. I know we don't agree on a lot, mm -hmm. but at least they're willing to engage me in conversation. And they call a lot of these students here useful idiots. Mm -hmm. I've, I've heard that. And I'm like, that is a... So these kids are Americans in their own country on their college campuses, you know, just 
just tra trashing the United States. I and, do. And the Muslim guys sit back and say, what a bunch of useful idiots. Uh, brother, brother Rob, this is kind of the bitter kind of truth. And that's very right. I, uh, I can tell you, I had experience with young people. I talked to them. American church and American families, they don't want their kids to stay closer to the reality. Right. They just want to live, want them to live in the fictional life, fantasy life. They do not want to expose them the true face of Christianity. And one girl, she came to me and said, you know, oh, sir, why, by the way, um, aren't we supposed to make mistakes? I said, who told you that? I mean, they think you're just making mistake. That you you're supposed to intentionally make mistake. I said, if you're intentionally doing something wrong, that's not a mistake. Mistake means unintentional thing. Right. So they have no idea what is mistake mean. Right. But I mean, those people they're attending church and they're coming to the conferences and hear our um, Christian brother and sisters. They just let them to come to the camp and let them go back without learning anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I really believe a lot of those, you know, we keep our kids in a bubble and, and kind of paint a rosy picture. But I really believe a lot of them, we need to send some kids overseas to like where you're living and, and show them the reality and, 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 you know, what's going on, what you risk and how good we have it here. And maybe they would think differently. I mean, they shut down a college because of the election results, because the kids couldn't go to class. They were too upset. Oh, wow. Yes. I mean, that's how delicate we've allowed these children to become. Some of them, not all, not all. There's oh, then, then you, have, you know, Brother Rob, you know, how many, you know, teenager people or maybe even the 30s or uh, age of 30 people in, 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 in America, they know the history of America. They don't know about the heroes. They don't know the, about the, you know, the brutal history of America, what happened to their ancestors, how difficult it was. They don't know about the civil war or kind of depression time. And we don't even like to teach them in our school because we think it's a horrible history. That's not horrible history. That's history. That's our past. Remember that. And we should be thankful because we are living in a wonderful world. We, I mean, and I mean, I mean, the nicest country. And I mean, nicest kind of the air and clean air you can breathe in. And uh, I have you have a long life and all, all kind of things. And here in Pakistan, where pollution is, Pakistan is kind of the second or third in the most polluted country in the world. I mean, if you go outside right now, Brother Rob, yep. you can just feel you are breathing in a very thick kind of smoke inside. Where does that come from? Uh, it's just a pollution, just like in vehicles and motorcycles and everything. It's a, it's a small city. There's so much traffic over here. And then the brick kiln kind of smoke. And then the people, they're burning all kinds of garbage, wherever they want. They're burning the shopping bags. They're burning tires and all kinds of things. Nobody actually care, you know, what's going to be happen. They're just looking for, okay, I, I will burn tires. I want to take out all the kind of wire from the tire. And I want to go to the... Um, uh, go to to some places and sell those wire mm. and uh, get some some money. Right, that's the reality there. I got it pretty good over here. <laughs> you know, people that I know have Muslim friends. Mm -hmm. What is the best thing or best way for them to approach a Muslim person to lead them to Christ or to get them to engage in conversation about Jesus Christ? Even brother, you know, I am not like a person just dancing around for five years, you know, dancing with this Muslim guy for five years, you know. Right. Whenever you meet a Muslim person, you should be very confident. Do not present themselves you don't know about Bible, you know. You should be very intentional when you talk to him or her. You should be very intentional to tell I am a Christian. You should be very bold. And whenever you present your case, to them, always talk with authority. That is the Muslim country. When you speak very uh, nicely and sophisticated way, or you think, you know, I don't want to hurt the feeling of this person. Maybe if I will say this thing, the person that must be disrespectful, that's not the case. 
Muslim people, they love to hear those people. They talk with the authority and they know what they believe. I love it. So two things on that. The common misperception or concept of what the word is there, but a lot of Christians believe, number one, they don't have confidence in their own belief. And they all believe or, or stereotypically believe that the Muslims do know what they believe. And I've found that not to be true. No, uh -huh. that, that's not, no that, that's not true because they, a lot of Muslim majority people, they're just following whatever they heard from any person. They have no research. But the way they say those things, they say those things with the, with the authority, just like they, they just believe it and know it. Right. So it's kind of like, I mean, they are, they are not any more an expert on the Quran as we, as many Christians are on the Bible. They don't know. I think the people that know a lot uh, about other religion and they, they studied a lot. The problem is this because they, they don't have a courage. I mean, sometimes reading so many books, sometimes make you just stuck in the office and <laughs> yeah. did not let help you to come into the street. I mean, just bring any scholar to tell him, would you mind to come in the crossroad and tell them people who Christ is? I mean, they can write books. I mean, writing book is a one thing, but preaching in person or in the public speaking for Christ boldly and with authority is a different thing. Agreed. Agreed. It's very, and it's very difficult. Not everybody uh, wants to do that or is equipped to do that. You almost have to be trained to do that. In some cases, yeah, I'm, I'm in the, you know, I mean, brother Rob, you know, we, when we go to the university, any Christian university, that's been my experience. I know this is you, you went to the same, uh, sh same experience. When we go to any university or Bible college, we focus so much, John Stott, maybe John MacArthur or other scholars, you know, and we do not even focus on the Bible directly. We are not encouraged to read the textbook, you know. And we just like go to the library, we just open the Bible, maybe verse, read one or two verses, and we are so you know lost in the interpretations uh, and all kinds of things, you know. Yes. What you call them? Uh, what the word? I, <laughs> I said commentary. Commentary, you can say, you know. Enjoy both of those authors, by the way, um, John MacArthur and John Stott. I like both them too, but yeah. you know. <laughs> So they're they're my favorite. I like them both. And but at the same time, sometimes I think I like to read the book, but first I want to read my textbook, which is Bible. Yes. I, I always felt studying, I didn't feel uh like I should read another book until I had a grip on the Bible. That's very good. That's very good. And I learned, you know, I spent a lot of time reading other books, but then I realized I'm missing one thing. I always feel I'm missing something. You know. Yeah. Uh, Stott wrote some good books. Actually, when he passed away, I was bummed. I really wanted to meet him before he passed. Oh, you do? Okay. I did, yeah. Jack Cartrell, his perspective is very different. Yes. And I like the way he very boldly tell his position, what he believed. And some scholars don't even like to tell you their perspective or their position. Well, he didn't like to tell you. He liked to write it, and he'd tell you, go read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, I, you, huh? you talking about Dr. Cartel? Yeah, I knew him really well. Yeah. Yeah, because he, when you read his book, he will always tell you that and what he believes. I disagree with this person. I, dis I agree with this person. And yeah. in this perspective, I like uh, this person. Because when I was in Cincinnati, sometimes I ask him, Professor, what do you believe? He said, yeah, you know, you can just, you know, yeah, you have, you can figure it out. That's what he would say to me. I would, um, I think he liked to drink Sprite. And I remember, I figured that out one time and I took yeah. the Sprite and I'm like, I already read your book. Now we're going to talk. And he did not like that. He's like, he would rub his face and go, go, go read my book again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, one thing I realized he was. I never talked to him. I did not know him very well. I can tell you still. Uh, Brittany always feel very comfortable to talk to him. And she always introduced me to him. Yeah. I can tell you, I never had a theological conversation with him, this person. And I told Brittany, Brittany, yeah, I don't know why, why my conversation didn't go very long with him. And she said, you know, I think he is not like a the person who can dialogue or the person who really very social.
mm-hmm. to talk and feel, you know, great among the people. Yeah. He just liked to write, you know. Yeah, he was not a social person. He was no, uh, no, he was an intellectual. Intelli- yeah, that's, that's, that's very true. And and just for people watching, Jack Cottrell worked at Cincinnati Christian University. He wrote theological books, probably around 28 books. Ooh, yeah. There's quite a that's few. Good. That's that's right. Yeah, you wouldn't. He he would be a hard guy to have coffee with, but a great mind for writing. That's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah, that's what I always feel like. And you know, sometimes when you <clears throat> uh, become a scholar, you know, sometimes you cut off from the people. You know. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. He isolated himself quite a bit, but he was a. Br- yeah. I took every one of his classes. Exactly. Yeah. And then and then I boldly and at risk. <laughs> Said, I ain't <laughs> buying any of your books unless you sign them. And I made him sign every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, after you told him, you know, I never, I never talked to him very much. You know, I, Brittany actually, I used to be in, in his class, but I never asked questions to him uh, because I know he can just like bash you and all. Can, oh, yeah, this is, this is not every question, you know, talks. Together. Oh, and he would know his books. He'd be like, go read my book, Faith No More, Chapter 10. <laughs> that was his answer. <laughs> that's, that's exactly that, that's true. That's very true. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's yeah. awesome, Sammy. I love what you're doing, man. Um, I, I, we covered a lot. We covered. How are you doing today? How's your family? Uh, family doing great, and um, I did some work on what you call uh, morning Bible reading, and just went and visit school, which is um. Uh, coming along and be finished very soon and so um, uh, getting ready for tomorrow preaching tomorrow I'm preaching in my uh, one sister church so one yeah. of the sisters now how so far- it's it, it been a good day just yeah. except that smog we have a lot of smog it's not like in, um, what you call it fog or something it's a smog which is kind of the combination of smoke and other things yeah that's uh so touching on that, when you, when you were talking about the smog, and then you were talking about COVID too. How how has Pakistan or your area recovered from COVID? COVID, you know, that's interesting because I think the COVID was just for the rich countries. You know, it was not for the poor country. That was a sickness for the rich people. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> funny. I can tell you because the, the poor people they didn't even care in Pakistan. Yeah. They were doing the just normal, normal kind of them. Things that they are going for the job, they're working in like a labor work. And when you talk to them, hey, there is a corona. They say, oh, I don't care if I if I think about the corona, how I can feed my family. So right. they cannot have so much kind of them. Uh, they worried about the corona. They were worried about food. So I think that was a blessing. And ideally, as I see the very least kind of the depression among the poor people. Mostly people, they were very hard feeling, very, you know, you know, um, terrifying and scared. They were all the Christian, uh, all the rich people they were worried about. In the USA, yes. there was so much depression during that time. And I was feeling like, I mean, I was feeling very nervous about it that time. And then one day I realized what I have to do this time. So I started a street evangelism during that time. And we decided every evening, everybody stand into the streets, 10 feet away from each other. And every six o'clock, evening in the six o'clock, we all the community people that come out from their homes and gather into the streets, standing far away. And every Sunday, every, every day, I start preaching half an hour. We sing some one or two psalms. And that was our became our schedule every day during the corona time wow that's wonderful i mean we didn't change a thing honestly here personally um mm-hmm. the church made me shut down i didn't want to do it but we did just to be honorable to our government sure um, but uh i think here in the united states they they literally let people starve to death in the name of covid it was they did yeah, yeah they but you know we have very rare kind of. I mean, we have some incidents in Pakistan. Some people they uh, passed away, but I didn't. I didn't see that because there are so many people. They just like they were showing the, uh, you know, horrible facts and data about Europe and America and all kind of things. But when I was looking at India or Pakistan, 
those people, they were not worried about Corona. They were most likely worried about their food. Yeah. I think it's more important to eat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's what our prime minister said. Yeah. When the, when the government, the, I mean, the United Nations, they told them to put restriction on your country. And and he said, sorry, I can't do it. If they stay at their home, they're going to die anyway. So why don't I let them to go and work? And we'll yeah. see what happens. And that was the best decision he made during that time. That's just common sense. You know, yes. the common sense needs to prevail. And they prevailed. I mean, the people, I mean, during that time, all the young kids, they were playing cricket in the street and the people, they were just doing the job and they were, having, they were just enjoying. I mean, the young people, they were just enjoying in Pakistan. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, they, they locked us down pretty good. No, that's what's very bad over there, I know. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let me read over. I got some notes because I want to make sure I cover everything. Number one, again, I admire you. I love your vision, your your entrepreneurial spirit, your commitment to the gospel. Uh, your family is just totally committed. I, I love it. And, and multi-talented. I mean, Brittany sings, you preach, you write. I mean, uh, brilliant, brilliant family. Um, Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, what, one of the things you were doing in the past that I remember was you had sewing shops. You were had the people were making money by sewing. You they, still they were. But that's happened. <clears throat> this project was affected during the Corona time because we didn't have enough fund to run the sewing center. So we temporarily shut down during that time. Okay. You haven't. Uh, was that was that financially? Did that help the church much? Uh, not really. Actually, the, the our main goal was just to train the women. So young women, they never been in school. So when they get married, at least they uh, they have a kind of a skill. Uh, if they get like him, lose her husband. So they have a skill and they can make something staying at their home. We realized if they have that skill, they can they can sew the clothes at their home and they can uh, make some money over there. And some women, they're doing actually. Very good. So um, other than that, what kind of industry or uh, employment is available in Pakistan? I mean, we can do in Pakistan, you can do like all kind of the business. There's no restriction, you know. Uh, you can do like a, a grocery shop. You can have all kind of the shops. I mean, everything is open as long as you have finances. Okay. In future, if we will have like a strong sewing kind of the center, then I have a vision to start a Christian boutique where Christian women, they can make the products and they can sell at that boutique. Okay. That, that's that's fantastic. How long, how, how far in the future is that? These are just like, a, these are the, just the ideas, you know, having a school and uh, having a sewing center, having a boutique center, most of the things they just not <clears throat> going very well because of uh, the lack of fund. Mm. I have a friend here from Thailand, and he said that he works for his sister doing nails and hair. And so he he makes over a hundred thousand dollars a year in the United States. Very good. They can. They can. I can. I can see it. Is that uh, the type of income they could make in Pakistan if they did that? Could they, they, they can do because the clothing yeah, and kind of thing can be a good place where the Christian girls, especially I'm talking about the Christian girls, they can easily work in this boutique center. They don't need to be around men. And that boutique center will be just for the women, the Muslim and Christian women. They can go and buy the clothes. And hmm. so, uh, so let me ask you one more thing and I'll, and I'll let you guys appreciate your time, Tammy. Um, or I should say Dr. Gill, shouldn't I? No, no, no. <laughs> I like when you call me Sammy. I love this. <laughs> I've always called you. This is enduring when you say it shows like you love me, man. I do, brother. I love it. I'm jealous of your biceps. <laughs> <laughs> the, the way you did it, and I wish I could have done. <laughs> so if anybody wants to donate or support your ministry, where, where, what do they have to do? It's simply you can also uh, donate online. Uh, you can use a, a Zelle account. You can use, um, um, I mean, you can make a check to New Hope for the World. New Hope uh, for the World. I, yes. Okay. You know, 
mentioned that in the memo, you can mention that this is for, for Sam and Brittany's personal use. This is for the school building. This is for the sewing center. This is for the Brickkill family, which we are releasing um, uh, time, uh, time to time. And whenever we get in a fund, we always uh, like to take um, some people from the from the out of the brick kiln. And the one of them, maybe I mentioned in our newsletter, he's a person who started the church and he's running a church now. Okay. So go online, look for New Hope for the World. And yeah, then- maybe I can send you the link exactly. What is okay. that link? That would be helpful. Uh, instead of maybe people, they may be confused. I can ask Brittany, she can send you the online information and, uh, and, and um, you know, just like a regular kind of the sending check address. How much does it cost, for example, to get one person or a family out of the brick kilns? Sometimes it could be a 500 to maybe a $2,000. So maybe somebody could say, here's $2,000, get a family out of the kilns. Yeah, it means you are... Uh, you are releasing like a, not like a husband and wife, you're releasing like a six or seven kids with that family too. Okay. So six or seven kids for the yeah. donation of 500 yeah. to $2,000, we can get them out of the kilns where they're not yeah. working in 130 degree yeah. weather at six sure. and seven years old. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's a, that's excellent. And this, I so wish the American media would pick up on this kind of stuff to expose it. And maybe people would be willing to help. And maybe, I think, Rob, you know, American people, they are very loving, they're very kind people. I met a very genuine people in America. They really want to do amazing things for the Lord. And they do not care about anything. And they think their money and their houses, everything is belong to God. So they've yeah. been very generous and they really have a heart for the people. They're oh. going through and the bond slavery. Yeah, there are some people very generous. That's why I'm saying. I think there's a lot of people that have a heart to give. They don't know how. That's that's very that's that's true too. Yes. So that's what I'm trying to do is is make that easy for them. And I'm going to try to put some links in the description for that reason. So maybe they can do that and help you and help those people. That will be wonderful.